Let's talk about simple pendulums. A simple pendulum is when you have a mass, also called the bob, on a long, non-stretchable string of, that we pretend has no mass. Okay, so all the mass is just in the bob, and it swings back and forth like this. So let's try and find out how long it takes to make one complete cycle. So if I pull it up to here and let it go, how long will it take it to go and back? Also called the period. So we're going to try and find the period. Well, to do this, first we need to figure out what the what is the restoring force for this bob. In a spring and with a mass on it, the restoring force was the spring force. Now it's gravity. So let's draw a free body diagram of our bob. I'm just going to draw it right next next door to this thing here. Okay, here's my bob of mass m. Oh, m. Come on. Let's see, M. Um, well, what forces do we have acting? We've got we've got the tension of the string, kind of going like that, tension, and we've got gravity. Okay, I'm going to call that M times G. We also know that we have an angle here, so this is supposed to be about the same picture. So if I call this, I'm just going to call this theta, then Let's see. Let's see. Then this is theta right there, and I've got this thing. It's swinging. It's gonna swing like kind of in a uh, well. It's a piece of circle, really. So I could also say that that's theta. And I'm going to go ahead and break down, and remember, don't put these on the same free body diagram on your AP test, but um, this here is the piece of gravity that is um, adjacent to the angle, so this is going to be mg cosine theta, and I've also got this, it's the piece of gravity that is well, it's the same as over here. If I just slid it over here, that's opposite. So that's going to be mg sine theta. And the reason I want those is because really this piece is just pulling against the string. It's not really helping anything. It's just it's just pulling against the string. Whereas this piece is actually making this thing swing back. It's, it's making it go along the uh, tangent to the circle it's trying to make. So frankly, this is the only thing we really care about. These two end up canceling each other out, and they don't pull along the circle we're trying to make, because there is a circle. I'm going to really quick just kind of sketch it. It's trying to make a circle that... Oh, wow, I did a crappy job. <laughs> okay, um, it's trying to make it do a circle like that. Ignore this funny bump I made. Weird. Um, notice, so this is actually tangent to that circle. This, this force, is the one that is providing a torque on this whole system. And it's the only thing that matters. The other ones are going to cancel themselves out. So let's focus on that. The torque it gives me... Uh, how about purple? Okay, um, well, any torque is the force times the radius at which the force is acting, and this is acting tangent to the radius, or sorry, perpendicular to the radius, so there, I don't need to put the cosine on there. So basically, the torque I've got here is, let's see, it's, it's bringing us back toward equilibrium, so it's going to be negative, here's the force... Ooh, my pen isn't working very well. And then the radius is, from the pivot point, is L. Okay, so this is what I get. Now what is that torque doing? Well, if this was at rest when I let it go, it the torque is making it accelerate angularly toward the, um, toward the equilibrium here. So the torque, remember that net torque is moment of inertia times angular acceleration. I'm going to go put that over here. I'm also going to make my pen smaller. Sorry. No purpose for that. I just 
annoying to have a unsharpened pen thing. Okay, that's going to be negative mg. I'm going to move the L out in front. Usually you put trigonometric functions on the end of the of the um, term. Where, don't forget, I is the angular uh, mo the moment of inertia about the pivot point of this whole thing, and alpha is the angular acceleration about the pivot point. Now we're going to do a little thing to make this slightly simpler, and that is if we keep theta small, like under 15 degrees or something, it turns out that the sine of theta is about equal to just theta, straight up. It's um, This is called the small angle approximation. For small angles, the sine of theta is about equal to theta. Go ahead and try it in your calculator. Okay, For instance, the sine of 5 degrees um, is about 0.8, calculator, 0.873. Radians, um, sorry, so so the sine of theta is about 0.872, and then five degrees in radians is about 0.873. It's almost the same number, almost the same number. And as long as you keep the angle small, that's true. So if we keep the angle small, we can say this. Just just that. That's an L. I don't know why I wrote it like that. Okay, which is going to make things a lot easier later, so we can write that, in which case then alpha ends up being um, negative mgl theta over moment of inertia. The negative is just telling us that this is a restoring force. Basically, this is trying to pull the bob back to this dotted line, the equilibrium position. If we were on the other side, it would be trying to pull it back over to the equilibrium position the other way. Now if you look at this purple equation here, it looks an awful lot like that A as a function of the position of X, or sorry, that A was, I'm going to leave that off, that's just confusing. A was equal to um, negative omega squared times X, okay, it was A of T actually. A of t was equal to negative omega squared um, times the function for x of t. Remember that was something we got when we were talking about simple harmonic motion. So this is linear a, that's angular a. This is linear position, that's angular position. This is a bunch of constants, that's a constant. So really what we have here is the same form of equation, so this must also be simple harmonic motion. It's just angular. And we can yank out an omega for this. So if these match and those match, then this stuff in here must be the same as omega squared. M, G, L, I. We also know from simple harmonic motion that omega is what you get when you do 2 pi over period. So if I put that over here, now I get 4 pi squared over t squared equals mgli. If I solve this for t, what I get is t, actually I'm going to do t squared first. I get t squared equals 4 pi squared i over mgl. Okay, so t ends up being, well, square root of everything. So square root of 4 is 2. Square root of pi squared is pi. Square root of all this is the square root of all this. Okay. So this is the period of a pendulum, but we can do even a little bit more because this here I, remember, was the moment of inertia. And for a simple pendulum, that is just all the masses in this particle here at a radius of L. So you can treat it like a particle. And remember, for a particle, for any particle, I is, I is just M 
r squared. In this case, r is l, so really i is just m l squared. So I'm going to go and put that bloop in there. And now I have that period is 2 pi square root ml squared over mgl. Notice the m's cancel out inside here. And one of the l's cancels out too. So all that's left, and I'm going to put this one in bright blue so it's easier to see. Um, all that's left is that the period of a simple pendulum is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. That's it. The period of a pendulum only depends on the length of the string, and basically the gravity of the, uh, the acceleration of gravity of wherever you are. So the only way you could change the pendulum's period is if you made it longer or shorter, or if you went to another planet.